Hello, I'm Bill Allett, and it's my great honor today to be here with Ed Roberts, the David Sarnoff Professor of Management and Technology at MIT Sloan School of Management. Ed is the founder and chair of the Martin Trust Center for MIT Entrepreneurship, and he is the seminal thought leader and scholar in the topic of entrepreneurship and innovation, the impact it's had on our society. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Well, Ed, let's start off from the beginning. We were both educated as engineers. And when you want to solve a problem, you have to define your terms. That's where you start. So let's start off by defining what is entrepreneurship? Good question. Uh, I define entrepreneurship as founding a new organization. So if you're not there at the very beginning, then to me, you're not the entrepreneur. You may be a great person, but you're not the entrepreneur. So starting something brand new and being there from day one, perhaps with some other people who are your co-founders, is what I define as, as the entrepreneur. Our interests are heavily for-profit entrepreneurship, but nevertheless, it could be social entrepreneurship, it could be not-for-profit entrepreneurship, it could be educational institution entrepreneurship. In every case, it's the same. It's those people who are there at the outset to begin to make something happen. But, but there are different types of entrepreneurship, are there not? There are, especially in the business world. Uh, there's two broad categories that we talk about. One is called SME entrepreneurship, which stands for small and medium-sized enterprises. And the other is innovation-driven entrepreneurs, which are companies that are based upon either science and technology or novel ideas or unique approaches and put together to try to create enterprises that are going to be characterized by growth and development. Those are very different kinds of things. SMEs tend to be local, city, community. They may be family. They're wonderful to have, but they don't create dramatic amount of impact over time. Innovation-driven entrepreneurship, on the other hand, seeks from the outset to build a vehicle that has growth, not just of market, you don't focus on local, you focus on national, you focus on global, but also the potential to really have impact over time on the economies where you are operating. Yeah, and the, the examples of an SME is kind of like a nail salon, a restaurant, a you know a service company that deals with local, and over here you've got you know Akamai or Hewlett Packard, they sell products to the entire world. We have a lot of both, among our own database of MIT alumni, there's a lot of MIT alumni who are building lifestyle companies that are the SMEs. But fortunately, we've got a good number who are building those wonderful growth companies that are impacting the whole society. And we're going to talk about that later, the impact about innovation-driven entrepreneurship. Great. One question for you, Ed. You know, 1964, that's 51 years ago. You started studying this. You know, you wrote the seminal book in 1991. How did you decide to study this as a field? It's interesting. I was a third year assistant professor in 1964, and a professor in the aeronautics department had a political problem with NASA headquarters. NASA wanted him to tell them how does aerospace research affect society. He called us up at the Sloan School, said, I don't have a clue, can you guys come over? And in sitting with him, I said, don't people leave your laboratories to start new companies? And he said, sure they do. I said, don't they take with them ideas that come from their work? He said, sure they do. And I said, I think if I studied them, I would be able to demonstrate that the answer to NASA's question is all in the kinds of labs and entrepreneurs that come out of your place. And the guy said to me, and remember I was a kid, relatively speaking, he said to me, okay, you've got your money, now, Give me a paragraph that says what you're going to do. And entrepreneurship research at MIT was born in 1964. Once you said innovation equals invention plus commercialization. And um, I never forgot that. I like the simplicity. So innovation-driven entrepreneurship is something that thrives at MIT. Yet there are other places that, that have similar caliber students, similar caliber research, but they don't produce the companies. What is it that makes MIT different? I think MIT's heritage makes MIT different. Uh, you know that from 150 years ago when MIT was founded, it developed a logo called of mens et manus in Latin, mind and hand. And I always, from when I was an undergraduate student at MIT, I always envisioned that logo 
that showed a scholar in a cap and gown facing a smithy with, his, with a hammer in his hand on an anvil. And the image of the scholar and the smithy together said to me that this is a place, MIT, MIT is a place where what you're trying to do is to create knowledge that can be translated into use and impact. And I think that from the beginning, MIT created that kind of a motif and a culture. And the culture was generated early on. It got translated into leadership by MIT people in the industrialization of America in the beginning of the 20th century. It's continued into all of the major industrial changes with computers and semiconductors and biotechnology and the like. So right from the beginning, the DNA, mens amanas. But how did that happen? I mean, you can say that the, a lot of other places had similar um, logos, mottos, but they didn't execute it on the way that MIT did. And, and I'm getting to the point where, you know, we talked about at the center, what are we trying to do? We're trying to educate, nurture, network, and then we added this term celebrate because it's, it's, entrepreneurship is about a spirit, a culture, and, and what is it that's unique about MIT that you've seen in your research that really makes that difference? That's a very difficult question to both answer, and it's more difficult to create an organization that makes it happen. Uh, I think that the culture is translated throughout all of the MIT coursework and the like. I think that the people who have come to MIT as faculty had that instilled in them that they were there to do important things and to solve critical problems. You know, the engineers have the right attitude about the notion of solving problems. Solving problems does not mean coming up with knowledge. Solving problems means making a problem go away. That means doing something that's a change. What happened when we built a management school, and when we built a management school with a heavy focus upon entrepreneurship, is that we advanced the engineers' ideas to become much broader to talk about how do organizations go about doing this, not just how do individuals or groups of individuals do it. And I think what we have brought to bear on this whole process is that we have instructed people how to both think through the ideas on their route to the marketplace and how to think through how do you pull other people together and build an organization that is going to be meaningful and effective and accomplish your goals. And that tying together of managerial ideas and organizational ideas with technical notions is where I believe we've been quite superb. I mean, there's so many things unique about MIT. It's not, an, it's not a university. It's an institute. It's a land-grant institute that was set up in 1861-63 to train immigrants and immigrants' children to man the Industrial Revolution. Another subtlety is MIT Sloan is a school of management, not a school of business administration. Can you elaborate on that and what impact that's had on entrepreneurship? Well, it's quite interesting. The management notion was to take a series of concepts, disciplines, ideas, and say, how do you apply these to whatever it is you're trying to do? The Sloan School, very early on, had deans that were willing to pursue management issues into not-for-profit organizations and the like. Uh, I and two other faculty many, many years ago started our first course on managing healthcare organizations and healthcare delivery and educational organizations. So we didn't think we were doing anything novel. We thought we were taking the principles of management and organization and entrepreneurship in creating new organizations and pursuing them wherever. And I think that uh, the same notions were forbidden at other institutions, uh, some of which we could readily identify. But it is a difference between management and business administration. It's kind of the difference between management and leadership in some sense, which ironically, Sloan is a school of management that's teaching leadership as opposed to business administration, which seems to be teaching more management. But I think it's more important to say that what we're doing now is that we're focusing on entrepreneurship. Uh, and I think it even goes beyond management because to try to get people to understand creation mm -hmm. and building something and assemblage of resources and of people and skills and knowledge, that's a very different set of task-oriented approaches and we do that in entrepreneurship. Absolutely. 
So Ed, one of the things that was really powerful to me when I came to MIT in 1993, and I, and I took your class, was going through the research and dispelling the myths that I had about entrepreneurship, which not only were wrong, but they were harmful. And the first one was about entrepreneurs is there are these mercurial individualists who overcome all odds. And then your research says that's not the case. First of all, of course there are some of those individuals and they are wonderful as individuals. But the problem is that that doesn't match the data. So I grew up with the same mythology that you, Horatio Alger explained everything, the hero who did it all as, a, as his own. And then I started collecting data. And the first thing I found was that if you started a company all by yourself, there was a very high likelihood you would fail. And much to my surprise, that wasn't the case once you began joining with others. So two people as partners founding a company did much better than solo entrepreneurs in succeeding. Three did better than two. Four did better than three. And as an academic, that was statistically significant that one to two to three to four improved statistically. So the very important first lesson I learned is while individuals are important and some individuals are marvelous, it's teams that are the key to entrepreneurial success. But it not, it's not just any team as your research showed, right? No, correct. So you're right. And what we found, which has affected all of our educational programs, is that the team to be most successful ought to not be homogeneous, it needs to be heterogeneous. You need to have mixtures of skills and diversity, especially from a point of view of structure. You need some people with managerial background and talent combining with some people with technical background and talent. And if you have that combination, much more likely that they're gonna be successful, by the way, if the people with managerial background include someone with sales or marketing background, that's still better. So that's the way, the, the, in a way, the formula. A team that has multiplic multiplicity of skills and background, especially with sales and marketing so that you focus on customers. Now, now the next part of it, well, entrepreneurship can't be taught. You know, that either you have it or you don't. And, you know, Steve Jobs never went to school for entrepreneurship. You, you just be, you are an entrepreneur. You aren't. So but, I, but your data your, your data shows very compellingly something different. Okay, uh, the part of the data that I think is explaining of the process is the stuff that we did that really shows learning occurring. The place that shows learning best is for those people, forty percent of the entrepreneurs who form more than one company. When they form more than one company, we got multiple evidences of performance. And what we find is that second companies do better in performance than first companies. Third companies do better than second companies. Now, this is a statistical statement. It doesn't always happen. You know, sometimes the second company fails when the first company succeeded. But the trend lines are there, and that's very important because it says learning occurs via an experiential process. Okay, now, what did we do to amplify that? We have combined organizing disciplined knowledge across the board of the field of founding and building a company with experiential learning. We try to get our students exposed to all of that. And frankly, I think that the data show we've been succeeding at that more and more year after year. So this goes back to the point, the last point that I want to make here is the myth, the huge impact that MIT's had. And people say, well, that impact is because they're just taking the technology in our labs and moving it out, yet the data shows something different. Well, first of all, people really didn't know how big that impact was. Yes. So let me make sure you understand, even in our old data that's now 10 years old, what we found was almost 26,000 companies still alive by living MIT alumni, forgetting all the ones where the alumni's dead or the company's dead, alive, alive, 26,000. Em employees, over three million. Revenues, about $2 trillion. When we put it together, that aggregate is about the 11th largest economy in the world. Coming out of little one, less than one square mile here in Cambridge. <laughs> less than one square mile. Well, less than one very unusual square mile. So that kind of impact, I think, is terribly important. Hardly all of that comes from just 
science and technology being transferred to the marketplace, we have what I think is uniformly understood to be the best licensing office in the university world. The technology licensing office does a great job and licenses MIT technology via patents to 22 startups a year, only 22 startups a year. That's been steady for the last 15 years. Well, guess what? MIT alumni are starting 1,000 companies a year. So somehow, the rest of those alumni are not taking a piece of licensed science out of MIT and jumping it to the market. They're taking a much broader base of knowledge, of learning, of skills, and we've managed to get very smart people to be well educated so that they have a skills and knowledge base that they can then apply. And we've done a lot of emphasis on how you go about applying yourself and your knowledge to the marketplace. And that's where I think our thousand company a year impact comes from. Before we end here, I just want to look forward and say, you know, look, Ed, you've, you've had a, a, an incredible career you know, starting looking at entrepreneurship in 1964 to today. Right. I mean, this is, this is 50 years, 51 right. years to be precise. Looking forward now, what advice would you give to business, business leaders about entrepreneurship? What, would, what advice would you give to government people about how, how they can promote entrepreneurship? I would start first with educators. And the reason I would start with educators is that I think that there are people who have leverage over large numbers of fresh young minds, and those are the educators. And what I would say is that the key to why we have been successful is that we have followed some of the lessons from those research and embedded them into our organizations and our coursework. Number one, we've realized that we want to preach and practice teamwork. Number two, we realize that we want to preach and practice collaboration across disciplines, especially managerial disciplines and technical disciplines. Number three, we've practiced the notion of bringing in practitioners and academics and putting them together in the classroom and causing our students to be learning both from the people with the experience and the wisdom of experience and success and those who've been able to create academic disciplines. Those are the kinds of things that other universities could copy and it would be wonderful if they understood that kind of activity. I would say those principles underlie all we've done. Now if we take those principles and go to government and say what could government be doing? Well, I think that we have too much government emphasis on SMEs, too much government emphasis on small business, when our whole emphasis is on innovative driven growth uh, companies. So there's a difference. If I had my way, I would take the Small Business Administration, change its name to the New Business Administration, and with a new name, I would then start to look at all the policies that they follow and ask, are we doing things that encourage formation and growth of innovation-based companies, or are we focused really on stability and the maintenance and support of, of businesses that are not going to get above five to ten employees? The last part of what you said, the first notion was, what would you say to business leaders? That's the hardest. Mm -hmm. Because if you said to business leaders, how can you make your corporation more entrepreneurial? That's very tough. Because then the question becomes very strong changes of dictum. You take a corporation that's been running itself for its own, whatever it has, its own product lines, and yep. you're saying, start to do things in the firm that are going to be for new things yeah. and novel activities. Yep. That's a very difficult thing to do. We call it intrapreneurship, not entrepreneurship, and my judgment is that it's the harder pathway. So from our perspective, as you see in the entrepreneurship program, we are focused mostly on the creation of new and somewhat less on how do we take and renew the old.
Well, I think that's an excellent way to, to, to end this. That's, that's one of the challenges going forward, is how do we invigorate these larger organizations, which were our children of last year. Now we're thinking about grandchildren, <laughs> but we, let's not forget the children that we've already grown, and how do we keep them innovative? Well, thank you very much. I, I like the way you turned around the question from saying business leaders and government to educators, because at the end of the day, we are educators. We are knowledge vendors, as you said, teaching people how to do this, and teaching people how to, how to fish, well, then they'll catch many fish over time, and that's the business we're in. So I can't thank you enough, Ed. It's been an honor. Bill, it's delightful to be with you as always. Thank you. Thank you.